really hate to see a bright young man fuck up and get off on the wrong track. Who are you? I'm Bill. Where are you, Tony? I'm in London, Bill. I'm Bill. Where are you, Tony? I'm in London. Yes. Hello. Hi. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. about to witness the most amazing, the most astounding. As a frontline weapon to produce and escalate riots underlined. And then, by means of beams, to raise himself. He was what? A beautiful woman.
underline full caps and quotes. My God, they're killing us. and living, breathing monstrosities. Look at that picture.
Bill. Where are you, Tony? I'm in London. Bill. Hello. 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 There we go. Um, welcome to Bridgeport and uh, the 25th Chicago Humanities Festival on the theme of journeys. I'm so happy to be here with you. I'm Allison Cuddy, and tonight we come together to celebrate William S. Burroughs, who would have been 100 years old this year. Although to me, he'll always be, I don't know, 55, maybe 60. <laughs> Um, so we've got an incredible evening in, in front of us. Um, I'm going to let Davis explain more to you, but I just want to thank everyone who's performing tonight. Um, you've already heard from the band Thomas Comerford with Eddie Krauss, Seth Vanek, and Tom McKettrick. Thank you guys so much. John Langford was also performing there. Thank you, John. Uh, other great musicians tonight, Daniel Knox is here. <laughs> Sally Timms is also in the house. <laughs> and a very special a band known as The Muttering Sickness, and that is David Schneiderman, Don Meyer, Joshua Corey, and Richard Pettengill. Thank you all. Finally, we have a lineup of amazing readers who are going to perform works either by Burroughs or inspired by Burroughs. Um, we have Tony Trujillo from Chicago in the house. Tony. Um, Sasha Frere Jones, music critic for The New Yorker, who did a great program with us earlier this evening. Sasha Frere Jones. The incredible poet Eileen Miles, who will also be doing yeah. Yes. You can catch her tomorrow at the Poetry Foundation as well. And then very special guests, Anne Waldman and her son Ambrose Bai. So um, we'll uh, kick it off in just a minute or two. We'll have a short intermission in the middle. Uh, don't go too far, because there's lots of stuff coming up. But thank you again for coming out, and um, enjoy the show. And here is David Schneiderman to tell you more. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Welcome, everyone. I just want to echo the thanks and uh, just thank the Chicago Humanities Festival for partnering with Lake Forest College in our first ever collaboration. You'll notice in either corner we have dream machines, and if you don't know what these are, I mean, they're wonderful aesthetic objects, but they were invented by Burroughs' collaborator, Brian Geisen. You, if you want to do them properly, you go up pretty close, you shut your eyes, and you're getting a flicker effect that supposedly syncs with the alpha waves of your brain, and you will see stuff, but they're just kind of cool things as well. And uh, we made them, so uh, big thanks to the Lake Forest College Physics Department for putting that together. Uh, if you know anything about, well, if you don't know a lot about William S. Burroughs, you might know some of the kind of things that most people know who don't know anything. Wife killer, junkie, but there's a lot of people here who have been very attentive to Burroughs' work, and part of the legacy of Burroughs at 100 is to think about the way his work anticipates the world that we live in today. Cut-ups, mash-ups, remixes, Twitter, all of these things are, in a sense, invented by Burroughs and the other thinkers who were working with him at the same time. You have a chance to participate in the world's largest cut-up in the back. It's not the first, nor will it be the last time we've done the world's largest cut-up, but here it is, and you can do it. So we've got a really great program of events. I want to welcome you one more time. We'll have the intermission, but let's get started with Sasha Frere Jones. Yeah. 
Immediately after the inauguration, Roosevelt appeared on the White House balcony, dressed in the purple robes of a Roman emperor and leading a blind, toothless lion on a gold chain. Hogg called his constituents to come and get their appointments. The constituents rushed up, grunting and squealing like the hogs they were. An old queen, known to the Brooklyn police as Jerk Off Annie, was named Joint Chief of Staff so that the younger staff officers were subject to unspeakable indignities in the lavatories of the Pentagon, to avoid which many set up field latrines in their offices. To a transvestite Lizzie went the post of Congressional Librarian. She immediately barred the male sex from the premises. A world-famous professor of philology suffered a broken jaw at the hands of a bull dyke when he attempted to enter the library. The library was given over to lesbian orgies, which she termed the rights of the vested virgins. A veteran panhandler was appointed secretary of state and disregarding the dignity of his office solicited nickels and dimes in the corridors of the State Department. Subway Slim. The lush worker assumed the office of Under Secretary of State and Chief Protocol and occasioned diplomatic rupture with England when the English ambassador came up on him. Lush worker term for a lush waking up when you were going through his pockets at a banquet in the Swedish embassy. Lonnie the Pimp became ambassador at large and went on tour with 50 secretaries exercising his despicable trade. A female impersonator known as Eddie the Lady headed the Atomic Energy Commission and enrolled the physicist into a male chorus which was booked as the Atomic Kids. In short, men who had gone gray and toothless in the faithful service of their country were summarily dismissed in the grossest terms like, you're fired, you old Fuck, get your piles out of here. And in many cases, thrown bodily out of their offices. Hoodlums and riffraff of the vilest caliber filled the highest offices of the land. To mention only a few of his scandalous appointments. Secretary, Treasury. Pantapon Mike, an old time schmecker. Head of FBI, a Turkish bath attendant and specialist in unethical massage. <laughs> Attorney General, a character known as the Mink, a peddler of used condoms and a short con artist. Secretary of Agriculture, Catfish Luke, the wastrel of Cuntville, Alabama, who had been drunk 20 years on paragoric and lemon extract. English ambassador, Blubber Wilson, who hustled his goofball money shaking down fetishists in shoe stores. Postmaster General, the Yen Pox Kid, an old time junkie and con man on the skids, currently working a routine known as taking it off the eye. You plant a fake cataract in the savage's eye, Savage is con man for sucker. It's the cheapest trick in the industry.
beautiful cactus by your window Survey the prairie of your room Mobile spins to its collision Clara puts her head between her paws They've opened shops down on the west side Well, all the cacti find a home But the key to the city Is in the sun that pins the branches to the sky Whoa, whoa I'm going to read from uh, uh, my new book, White Noise, which is at the table over there. I'm, um, it's a book that was uh, inspired by Burroughs' cut-up method, except I used digital cut-ups. It was all online cut-ups. Uh, five years of cutting up digital text and then two years of collaging it. And um, it's also sort of indebted to Burroughs in its uh, post-9-11 paranoia, or the, the paranoia and, uh, and goofiness, I hope. Uh, Aside from not being able to eat or sleep, he is exactly like a regular boy, delighting and mimicking and picking up new information as well as playing games. On another occasion, he obtained access to Excel spreadsheets entitled Non-Terrestrial Officers, containing the names and ranks of US Air Force personnel who are not registered anywhere else. Sure, he committed a crime, but being extradited to the US is like a pending death sentence. The Americans, he learned, plan to take him next to Syria. Having been told by his parents about the barbaric practices of the police in Syria, he begged crew members not to send him there, arguing he would surely be tortured. His captors did not respond to his request. Instead, they invited him to watch a spy thriller that was aired on board. He sleeps badly. A good percentage of the folks he does well are dead. I've heard him shouting during the night, but his cabin is some little distance from mine, and I could never distinguish what he said. I seem to recall banging on the door for an extended period of time, then leaving because no one would answer. Sometimes his t-shirts look a little worn out and wrinkled. His straight brown hair got stringy and stuck to his forehead, but he wasn't the sort of guy who cared. I can't look at Petraeus, his uniform ornamented like a Christmas tree with honors, medals, and ribbons, without thinking of the great Mort Saul at the peak of his brilliance. He talked about meeting General Westmoreland in the Vietnam days. Mort, in a virtuoso display of his uncanny detailed knowledge and memory of such things, recited the lengthy list Distinguished Service Medal, Croix de Guerre with Chevron, Bronze Star, Pacific Campaign, so on, naming each of the half acre of decorations, medals, ornaments, campaign ribbons, and other fripperies festooning the general's sternum and gaudy display. Finishing the detailed list, Mort observed, very impressive, adding, if you're 12. <laughs> We spent our nights with the American and the British soldiers each time in another camp, in another place where they were parked. We were with them. We got to a place which was 120 kilometers, which I think is 70 miles south of Baghdad, and there we met a group of soldiers, and Ted Koppel was there with uniforms, with a big helmet on his head. I did not recognize Ted Koppel, of course, 
And Ted Koppel looked at me and said, you're crazy. You don't have a gas mask. Are you crazy? Because they're going to use chemical weapons. The Red Cross set aside some gambling money. He's convinced that his lawyers are part of a continuing interrogation program and sees his captors as protectors. As the NSC liaison with FEMA from 1982 to 84, he developed a plan to suspend the Constitution in the event of a national crisis, such as nuclear war, violent and widespread internal dissent, or national opposition to a US military invasion abroad. The police have barricaded themselves inside the building and have changed all the locks on the building. The chairman has been asked for all his keys to be returned and his vehicle to be handed over. He'll be daring until his sovereignty gazes adequately. And the last bit I'm going to read is indebted to the very first time I saw Burroughs read. And one of his um, routines was on the American flag. And he said, you know what? I can't do an imitation. I'm not going to even try. But what, 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 what do I think of the American flag? I think if it were soaked in heroin, I'd suck on it. <laughs> so this is a story about making flags. Assassins pass the criterion. They fulfill a known fantasy archetype and are skilled in the art of assassination. I'm not sure how to make the flags. Fabric paint will not be soft, so it will not flutter in the wind. Maybe use some fabric markers. Maybe fabric markers will work. Would we give the dimensions of the flags to people and have each person make their own flag? Or would we have one person do it all? Reproducing a device on cloth is a lot of work. Maybe we could get everyone together for a flag-making session. We can't put men with guns close together and expect anything else. Excluding any good eureka moments, we'll just try to pull them all out with pins attached to a common string. But that feels so weak. Hello, I'm over here in the Thames. I thought I'd show you some of my slides uh, when the scholarship band went to visit Bill, Bill Burroughs in 1996. That's me on the right, that's Bill Burroughs in the other right, in the middle. Uh, Alan Ginsberg took his photograph. Imagine our surprise when we arrived in, in Lawrence, Kansas and went to visit, knocked on Bill Burroughs' door and Alan Ginsberg was eating grits and eggs at the kitchen table. It was, very exciting. That's Steve, oh, there's Steve Goulding, the drummer in the Meat Cons, with William Bowers. We went for, none of us could actually speak for about 15 minutes because it was such a strange situation, but we went for a nice walk in Bill's garden with Alan Ginsberg, and uh, who took that photograph and took this next photograph, which is, is good because everyone's laughing and I like that one, except for Bill Burroughs because he wasn't laughing. <laughs> He showed me his organ accumulator. He's very pleased that Kurt Cobain had been in there. But we also, he also was very proud of his fish pond. And it, being in Kansas, I asked him, uh, did it freeze over in the winter? And we looked at the fish pond, and uh, he said, yes, but, but it did freeze over. But a goldfish, he explained to me, can survive frozen inside a block of ice. And you can see him here. He's making a block of ice with his hands. And I said, I don't think that's true. I think they just live underneath the ice in the cold water. He said, he said to me, I believe it to be true. <laughs> Good bye to Willie.
John Langford, everybody.